August 28, 1990. Chicago's suburbs are baking under record heat, with barely a breeze out of place. No one imagines that within minutes, the only F5 tornado ever recorded in August will explode from the sky, leaving no warning, no footage, and a trail of devastation the city has never forgotten. 29 lives lost, hundreds injured, and an entire region caught completely off guard as technology and weather conspired to strike in total silence. Why was August's only killer both invisible and unstoppable? The answer starts with what nobody saw coming. By noon on August 28, 1990, the air over northern Illinois was thick and heavy, pressing down with temperatures soaring into the mid-90s and dew points in the upper 70s. The humidity was so high, it felt almost tropical, but this was the Midwest, and August was supposed to be winding down. Instead, the atmosphere was loaded with energy. Convective Available Potential Energy, or CAPE, measured between 7,000 and 8,000 joules per kilogram. For context, most severe storms need only about 2,000 to 3,000. Meteorologists use another measure, the lifted index, to judge how easily air will rise. On this day, it plunged to minus 14 degrees Celsius. That's not just unstable, it's explosive. What made the setup even stranger was the way boundaries collided. A classic lake breeze from Lake Michigan drifted southwest, meeting a strong cold front sliding in from the northwest. Above, an 80 to 85 knot jet stream, winds blowing at nearly 100 miles per hour, raced overhead. Each of these ingredients alone could produce severe storms, but together they created a perfect storm environment rarely seen in this region, let alone so late in the summer. The ground was already baking, but the real drama was unfolding miles above, where warm, moist air slammed into cooler, drier air. This collision zone acted like a loaded spring. The energy kept building, barely contained by the invisible boundaries in the sky. Supercells, those rotating thunderstorms capable of producing the most violent tornadoes, require exactly this kind of fuel. But on August 28th, the potential was off the charts. A storm finally ignited near Janesville, Wisconsin, just after midday. It began to drift southeast, tracing a path meteorologists would later call highly unusual. Most tornadoes in Illinois move northeast, not southeast. The atmosphere was so primed, so unstable, that the slightest spark could have triggered disaster. In fact, it was almost as if the sky was waiting for a reason to tear itself open. Few people on the ground had any idea what these numbers meant. Cape and lifted index are just numbers on a chart unless you know how much violence they can unleash. But for scientists watching the data, the message was clear. Something rare and dangerous was brewing, and the usual cues, darkening skies, swirling clouds, might not show up in time. The energy was there. The boundaries were set. All it would take was one storm to tap into that power, and everything below would be at its mercy. By early afternoon, the National Weather Service office in Chicago was already under pressure. Their main radar, a WSR-74C built in the 1970s, could only show precipitation echoes, no wind patterns, no velocity data, and no Doppler capability. Any signs of rotation or embedded tornadoes would have to be guessed from fuzzy reflectivity images, and even those images came with a catch. The radar's calibration was off by as much as seven miles. Forecasters watching the screens saw a storm, but the exact location and intensity were blurred, almost like trying to read a street sign through rain-streaked glass. The situation grew worse when their backup Doppler radar, a WSR-74S, was knocked out by a lightning strike earlier in the day. Maintenance logs from that morning show technicians scrambling to restore power but the system never came back online. That left the Chicago office with a single, outdated tool and no way to cross-check what they were seeing. Meanwhile, the AFOS computer network, 
the backbone for sending out warnings and internal alarms, suffered sporadic outages, causing delays in message relay and alert notifications. Even the pager system meant to wake up off-duty staff was unreliable, sometimes failing to sound when severe weather escalated. At 9.52 a.m., the risk level was quietly upgraded, but the language still didn't single out tornadoes. By 1.28 p.m., a severe thunderstorm watch was issued. Again, no mention of tornadoes, just a general alert for hail and damaging winds. At 1.42 p.m., weak tornadoes were reported elsewhere, but those didn't trigger any new warnings for Plainfield or the surrounding suburbs. The first real warning for the area, a severe thunderstorm warning, came at 2.32 p.m., but even that arrived late, missing the crucial window for meaningful preparation. No tornado warning was ever issued before impact. Inside the office, forecasters were stretched thin. Staffing logs show only a handful of meteorologists on shift, with no one assigned exclusively to radar duty. Some were covering multiple roles, shuffling between phone calls, radar interpretation, and routine forecasts. When spotter reports and police calls about funnel clouds started coming in, there was no clear protocol for relaying that information. Communications logs from the day show a jumble of missed connections, reports sent to the wrong desks, warnings delayed by minutes that felt like hours. As the supercell intensified and moved southeast, the radar's limitations became fatal. Classic signs of a tornadic storm, hook echoes, sudden reflectivity spikes, were either too subtle to notice or misplaced by the faulty calibration. The staff, relying on incomplete data, judged the storm as too disorganized for tornado development. By the time the tornado touched down at 3.15 p.m., sirens in Plainfield and Crest Hill remained silent. Emergency managers and local broadcasters received only generic thunderstorm statements, not the urgent tornado warning that could have saved lives. The first tornado warning wasn't drafted until after 3.45 p.m., almost half an hour after the tornado had already destroyed neighborhoods, schools, and apartment buildings. In the words of one survivor, we didn't hear a siren. The only warning I had was watching the sky turn black and feeling the windows shake. 10 seconds later, the house was gone. For the people of Plainfield, the system meant to protect them had gone dark at the very moment it was needed most. At 3.15 p.m., a narrow column of wind touched down just northwest of Oswego. The first marks it left behind were shallow gouges in farmland and a few battered farmhouses, signs of an F1 or maybe F2 tornado. But almost immediately, the wind began to accelerate feeding on the supercharged atmosphere above. Within minutes, the tornado was tearing southeast, growing in width and strength as it crossed open fields and isolated homesteads. Wheatland Plains sat directly in its path. In less than five minutes, 12 homes were reduced to splinters. The destruction here was so complete that entire foundations were swept clean and barns simply vanished. Insurance adjusters would later tally the losses in this stretch at $9.2 million, an enormous sum for a rural area in 1990. What was left behind was a checkerboard of bare earth, twisted metal, and fields where mature corn had been stripped down to the soil. It was in these open fields, just after 3.25 p.m., that the tornado reached its peak. Investigators found evidence that would become infamous a 20-ton tractor trailer, thrown more than half a mile from the highway, landing deep in a cornfield. The driver was killed instantly. Three other motorists in separate vehicles met the same fate, their cars hurled off the road and demolished. Later, Dr. Ted Fujita, the world's leading tornado researcher, walked these fields in person. He measured the scoured ground, the debris patterns, and the sheer distances traveled by heavy objects. In his private notes, he called the level of ground scouring and vehicle displacement absolute proof of F5 winds, winds strong enough to erase the landscape itself. No photographs captured the tornado here. The only record is in the aftermath. Fields scraped bare, homes erased, 
and massive vehicles tossed like toys. For the people who lived through it, and for the scientists who surveyed the ruins, this was the moment when the Plainfield storm revealed its full, unimaginable strength. The tornado was now an unstoppable force, bearing down on the outskirts of Plainfield and the neighborhoods that lay ahead. At 3.28 p.m., Plainfield High School stood squarely in the tornado's path. Football and volleyball teams were still outside, coaches watching as the sky turned from late summer blue to a bruised, unnatural gray. John Brandon, the football coach, and Dave Bublitz, who led volleyball, saw the wind pick up and made a split-second decision. They hustled more than 100 students off the fields, through the gym, and into a central hallway. As the last player crossed the threshold, a coach slammed the door shut, just as the gymnasium's roof tore away. The door was ripped clean off its hinges. In the chaos, the gym collapsed behind them, filling the doorway with debris. That hallway, and only that hallway, remained standing once the noise stopped. Three staff members, including a science teacher, lost their lives elsewhere in the building. For everyone in the hallway, survival came down to a matter of seconds and a coach's instinct. The tornado barreled on, carving a direct line through the heart of Plainfield. Houses, churches, and the public library vanished in minutes. The library alone lost over 12,000 books. Entire shelves sucked out as if by vacuum. Roads were blocked by piles of brick and splintered wood, and power lines lay tangled across the pavement. Peerless Estates, Lily Cash, Crystal Lawns, and Warwick Estates, names that once meant safe suburban living, were reduced to fields of debris. Hundreds of homes were flattened. Families found only fragments of their lives scattered for blocks. Cars were tossed into yards, and dumpsters wrapped around trees like tinfoil. By 3.35 p.m., the tornado's track cut through subdivision after subdivision, leaving nothing but exposed foundations and twisted metal. The storm's southeast march showed no sign of slowing. At 3.38 p.m., Crest Hill Lake's apartments took a direct hit. The buildings, built with standard wood framing, offered little resistance. Walls caved in, Floors collapsed, and entire sections of the complex disappeared in seconds. Eight people died here, among them a young mother and her infant child. Survivors described being thrown from their apartments or buried under rubble, with some pulled from the debris hours later. For Crest Hill, this was the deadliest single loss of the day, and it happened without warning, in the time it takes to boil a pot of water. By the time the tornado finally lifted, the suburban core had been carved open. The storm's path was defined not by what it left behind, but by what it erased. In less than 20 minutes, neighborhoods, schools, and entire families had been changed forever. The next hours would reveal stories of loss, survival, and impossible choices made in the face of unstoppable force. Among the wreckage and silence that followed, stories of loss and survival began to surface, each one adding a human face to the numbers. In a battered sedan along US Route 30, George and Lucille Riffle were driving their grandchildren home when the tornado overtook them. The car was thrown from the road, torn apart by winds no one had ever measured in Illinois in August. Both grandparents died instantly. But when first responders arrived, they found the two children alive near the wreckage, one of them ejected and discovered with barely a scratch. For the families who lost everything, it was a moment that felt impossible. Devastation and a miracle, side by side, in the same field. In the Peerless Estates subdivision, the tornado erased entire blocks in seconds. Christine Friedel and her infant daughter Amanda were inside their home as the walls gave way. The house collapsed but debris piled in such a way that it shielded the baby from the worst of the storm. When neighbors and firefighters picked through the rubble, they found Amanda alive, cradled by splintered boards and insulation. The press called her the Angel Baby, a symbol of hope in a neighborhood where so many others did not make it out. 
At St. Mary Immaculate School in Crest Hill, Dawn Kelly was caught in the chaos as the building began to come apart. She was thrown into a lower hallway, pinned beneath a heavy cabinet that had toppled during the collapse. That piece of furniture, by chance or fate, protected her from the falling debris. Rescue crews pulled her out hours later, shaken but alive. Elsewhere in the same building, others were not as fortunate. The tornado killed 29 people that afternoon, from a five-week-old baby to a 69-year-old grandparent. The average age was just 34. 353 others were injured, some with wounds that would heal, others with scars that would last a lifetime. For every statistic, there was a name, a family, and a split-second decision that meant the difference between life and death. The tornado's toll on Plainfield and its neighbors was measured in more than lost lives. In just under 20 minutes, the storm erased entire blocks, leaving behind a ledger of destruction that few American communities have ever faced. A total of 470 homes were destroyed outright. Roofs torn away, walls flattened, and foundations swept clean. For more than a thousand other families, what remained was barely standing. Shattered windows, collapsed garages, and interiors exposed to the sky. Insurance adjusters and city officials counted every address, compiling lists that stretched for pages. Some neighborhoods, like Peerless Estates and Crystal Lawns, saw nearly every house reduced to rubble. The devastation didn't stop at the front door. More than 50 businesses vanished from the map. Grocery stores, restaurants, auto shops, places that anchored daily life, were reduced to piles of bricks and twisted metal. Industrial buildings on the town's edge looked as though they'd been bombed, with steel beams bent around uprooted trees. The local library, once a quiet refuge, lost over 12,000 books in a matter of seconds. Shelves, desks, and entire collections were sucked out into the storm, scattered across fields and parking lots. For Plainfield, the loss of these institutions meant more than inconvenience. It was the erasure of community memory and routine. The price tag for the disaster was staggering. Damage estimates reached $165 million in 1990, a figure that would approach $380 million today. That sum covered homes, businesses, public buildings, vehicles, and infrastructure. Everything from power lines to school buses. Vehicles were found mangled beyond recognition. Dumpsters wrapped around tree trunks, and even heavy industrial freezers relocated hundreds of feet from their original sites. In the weeks that followed, officials struggled to account for every loss. But some things, family photos, school trophies, handwritten letters, were never recovered. The storm's path was mapped in numbers, but the true cost was felt in the empty lots and silent streets left behind. On August 28, 1990, a single F5 tornado killed 29 people and injured 353 in the only August event of its kind ever recorded in the United States. The absence of tornado warnings, due to outdated radar and a disabled backup, left entire communities unprepared. The storm destroyed 470 homes and over 50 businesses, with damage reaching $165 million. Facts confirmed by National Weather Service records and local archives. Yet, key questions remain. No known photographs or video of the tornado exist, and why the storm's path defied typical patterns is still debated among meteorologists. In the wake of the disaster, Federal documents show that NEXRAD Doppler radar deployment accelerated nationwide, and warning protocols were overhauled. Today's alerts and technology trace directly to lessons learned here. The Plainfield F5 stands as proof that even a single event can change safety standards for millions. On August 28th, Boomi, 1990, nature rewrote the rules. Plainfield paid the price, but the lessons learned ensure no storm will ever strike in silence again.